Uh, rolling with the homies. <laughs> oh, man, I wish I could just shove this food in my mouth. We don't have to do all the talking points. There's so many talking points to get into, but let's just go food. right ahead and get into talking during the movie. Ow! That's um, the first thing that I noticed about this movie was uh, in the opening credits. Actually, there are no opening credits. There's it's not. just the title that scrolls, scrolls across the screen, mm-hmm. screen just like... Um, just like a plane, train, or automobile would. Mm-hmm. And I, I was listening closely, and I noticed in the sound effects, it is the sound of a plane into the sound of a train into the sound of a car uh, as it's scrolling across the screen. Exactly um, right. I love that. That was one of the first points I had, too, uh, Durden. Uh, as I looked at it, it made me think, like, it's about as far as being creative. Like, people always say, I don't have this program, that program. That took nothing more than title effects that have been around for who since who knows when but mm-hmm. the the thought process and pre-production like wait a minute no have them in that order make it seem like they're running across your face and furthermore do them in that exact order 95 percent of people probably missed that and i know upon first watch i missed it but doing our deep dive i got wet yeah during as a kid i never caught that but that was like the first thing i noticed it's like huh, he did something interesting there with the uh with the sound design mm. one of the things i'm also uh, that I really love at the beginning, as soon as we get into the film, we catch a young Chris Golden, spry, Kevin Bacon. Uh, you know, those are one of the things, like you say, you see him and he's running against uh, N- Neil at the time, mm-hmm. and who was, of course, played by the iconic, legendary, needs no introduction, Steve Martin. One of the things I love, though, when that, that scene first starts, it sets it up so well that I don't even know if you caught it upon rewatch. Steve Martin. Neil is running down this New York street with all his stuff in his hand and he's trying to get out of the way of a people out of people and leave it to 80 slick stereotype uh black man on the on the block in New York. He tries to get past the one black man. The black man's like <laughs> like they're playing some little game. Did you catch that? No, I didn't. Oh. <laughs> I was I was more so I was more so just enamored by Steve Martin's shimmy run. Like he kept cutting to his feet, barely making it like how right. is he even running like that? And the, the quintessential 80s soundtrack, that ding, 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 is uh, very good. Um, one thing I wanted to take a moment to appreciate is John Hughes in general was such an amazing director at immersing you in whatever moment it's in. Um, oh, sorry, I'm not in my... Not in my sweat. Don't worry, guys. We filmed half the f***ing episode, and he's just not noticing. We need, we need, if you want to intern for TTFT, send in your resume. We just need somebody to literally tell him to take his f***ing jacket off. He said, the bloopers are, are just going to be us eating. No, it won't be. Ah, there Welcome we go. back. Yep, yep. Now I'm here. I knew I was going to do that when I put the damn jacket on. Ding. Um, but yeah, he's John Hughes is so great at, at putting you right in the moment you're in, making you feel... Not just the emotion, but but everything feels so tangible in his movies, from Home Alone to The Breakfast Club to this movie. Um, he's just so great at like just making you feel whatever is happening in the moment, and and capturing those little finite details that like just and it's extra effort that goes in. Like when Steve Martin's in the shower, he gets the soap all over his eyes. like. Mm-hmm. That soap is so strategically placed on his face, you could tell, to capture that feeling of, ah, ah, and it, like, little things like that. It's the best example I can come up with at the moment. Well, but, you brought up Home Alone. One of the things, of course, you know we're going to talk about clearly, uh, me and, when me and you talked last night, I was like, hey, man, I didn't even, I mean, I'll admit it, I didn't even know John Hughes did Home Alone again, because again, I haven't went back to see who the director was. I just remember Macaulay Culkin again, bathroom scene. Mm-hmm. Oh! But the reason why I bring it up is I kept saying, even before I knew it, when we when I did the rewatch, I'm like, this f***ing house looks so f***ing familiar. Now, it's a whole other story. We'll talk about that later. I'm pretty sure that's going to be in David's top 10 facts. Not the so, same house, but similar neighborhood. Similar neighborhood because it was one town over. Mm-hmm. And see, that's what most people don't know. So I wasn't wrong. Like It's like he built the exact house he wanted, which makes much more sense. But here's the crazy part about it. He goes and do, does Home Alone years later. And of course, they built that set in a gym. But the exterior of the house is just like the exterior of that house that uh, we saw in Planes, Trains. Again, mm-hmm. very similar, not the same one. Uh, one of the other things I wanted which, to mention. Which most, of, most of his movies, take, if, uh, if not all, take place mm-hmm. in Illinois. Right. Even The Breakfast Club, uh, I was I was 
really upset to find out later on in my life that Shermer High School, Shermer High School, Shermer, Illinois, mm-hmm. is not a real high school, and Shermer is not a real place. No. No, it's all fictional. Mm-hmm. Movie magic, love. Uh, but when you were talking about John Hughes, the director, I will say this. Um, when I went back and realized how much he did, I had to move him into one of my top 15 directors of all time. And the reason why I say that was one of the things you were just mentioning. Mentioning To me, he is a person, he did, he did to film what great announcers and storytellers did to radio. Like you said, they made you feel something. Mm-hmm. Like it's one thing for someone to talk and speak, but when they bring you into a story. So he's doing that with film, making you feel like your eyes are burning, making you feel that frustration. It, it takes a, see, it's not just the actor. It's the director knowing what he wants and the actor coming together. And that's what we'll talk about given later while this is one of those films that I think will be up there. But one of the other things I wanted to bring up was uh, when they first... What is it like the camera work? Um, when they first, and again, I don't know if it's a cinematographer, cinematographer, or whether it's John Hughes. When John, when Dale and Neil go into the the, the room for the first time, when they get their first hotel room, the moment Steve Martin's character Neil walks in the room, you see that quick survey. Now, mind you, he sees the bed, but he knows there is no way in hell that this is the only bed in the room. He surveys the goes past the bed, surveys the entire room, comes back, then looks again. I'm like, man, he was. What gets me is after after Neil is putting like like hanging his jacket or putting his stuff his way stuff away, you see Dell take another look at the bed, like <laughs> one more time, yeah, like. <laughs> Like, how are we both going to do this? What did he say when he walked in? Hey, man, you want to uh, you want to take a, you want to shower? No, me, no, no, you first. No, me, no, you, no, me. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. So when uh, one thing that I appreciated was when when Neil spots Dell in the airport for the first time, and they they show him remembering by like putting the cab door in front of him. They could have easily just cut to a flashback in the cab. But they took the extra step of bringing a prop door from a cabin, putting it up. Because I'm sure this was done practically. This was before the age of digital effects. They put the prop door in front of him just for him to react and Neil to have that time where he remembers him. This, Little things like that is what makes sets these movies apart. This is what was f***ing with me. The silent conversation from that same scene when John Candy's character, uh, Dale, is looking at Neil. Well, they both know it's them. Mm-hmm. But John Candy character, by the way, he has the Canadian book, the Canadian, the Canadian mounted book in front of him because he's Canadian. I don't know if you picked up on that, but he's he like like slowly lowering the fucking book from him, and then we see he puts it back up like mm-hmm. like I know it's you. Like what yeah. what, what are you what are you doing, man? And so to me that was crazy. And furthermore, which brings me back to another talking point of why he even got the cab in the first place. Before that, when Steve Martin's character's Ned is telling the guy, he was like, "Man, come on, appeal appeal to your soul." And something like, "I don't have a soul." He like, "Man, you're a thief." <laughs> like, "No, I'm close. I'm yeah. a lawyer." Like, yeah. God, like, dude, this is freaking crazy, man. Any guy, any man that'll pay fifty will surely pay seventy five. Yeah, Sounds like some male prostitute or something like that, man. It's yeah. crazy. Uh, when he gets bumped from, so you get a little bit of premonition of what's what's about to take place in the best scene in the movie. Way back in the first time he's getting on the plane and he gets bumped from first class. The uh, I have a I have a first class ticket. You have a coach assignment. But uh, when when she's like, "Sir, I've had about enough of you," he's like, "Oh, you've had, had about enough, enough of, of me." me. <laughs> <laughs> like right there, he already was in mode to be like, "I want my." In first class, yeah, yeah. right? Fucking and they up. had it circled. She showed it to him too. She was like, "Yes, a first class ticket." But on the back, they just wrote a culture sign, like, like a magic, magic marker. Brad or whoever the fuck comes in, she's like, "Oh, here, there, oh, anywhere." anywhere. Like, yeah, no. dude, love that, <laughs> love that, man. Uh, like I say, another thing about people being too comfortable. Rest in peace to the great John Candy again, Dale's character. Okay, it's one thing for you to sit next to somebody on the plane and they take their shoes off. You're like, what the, who the fuck is this guy? What do you mm-hmm. think? We're all on here together. He proceeds to, the, he first he said, you got to let him breathe. <laughs> then the socks come off. He's whiffing the sock around. And, and at that point, I would have got kicked off. I would have been on the no fly list. You're not going to yeah. whiff this sock in my fucking face. I'm not, I'm not doing it. Um, one of the things I also love later on in the movie, like how, what other actor, comedic actor, what other artist can pull off selling shower rings as earrings? On that note, how he pulls off selling these shower rings as earrings is kind of bothers me because he go. goes in that scene. He's like, people like me because I'm the real deal. What you see is what you get. Right. Meanwhile, let me get you like. These he's a salesman. Rings. That's what he meant by that. 
Okay. okay. Yeah, he's a so salesman. So by yeah. all means necessary. Yeah, you're right, right. He's the genuine thing. There you go, kid. Sold. You got it. Let's take a moment to appreciate Doobie's Taxiola and Doobie himself. I remember when I was a kid, this this immersed me right in... Uh, I, somehow it still feels like holiday, but it put me like right in the in the atmosphere of, of where these people are when they get in that taxi just the character in there the the set design in the cab itself i just thought it was fantastic and um larry hankin as doobie was yes. uh amazing he i think he went on to be in like billy madison and stuff like that uh, i mean i'm i'm insulting him because he's done a lot of a lot, a lot more great stuff but no he's definitely done a lot man i mean he I'll just I'll just send them to your fan page. It's okay. Um, okay, so this is one thing for me, and I found out later about this, but I have to get this out now. The scene later on in the film where they get picked up by the guy's son and uh, in the truck, the, the meth meth guy, meth meth country guy. He says a lot in that scene, but one of the things, I mean, out of all of the sideways. Sh- no pun intended, that he says in the scene. It's not what he says, it's what he does. Mm-hmm. He, sh- he shakes Dale Ripple's hand, and then he spits... But some of the spits get, gets in the way and he catches it with his hand. And the moment he catches it with his hand, he shakes Steve Martin's hand. And Steve Martin's like, yo, what the fuck? He doesn't even say, yo, what the fuck? And the reason why he does not say it, that was improvised. It, was, it wasn't John. improvised. John Hughes told him to do that to Steve Martin. Yeah. If I was Steve Martin, I would have knocked that dude's ass out. You're not going to spit in your hand. and, and you've, you've been dipping. Because Steve Martin is a known germaphobe Correct. in real life. So John Hughes went up to, um, what's his name? Uh, I want to say it I'm is... I'm just calling him Meth Man. He is a fantastic actor, still working quite a bit today. Um, Dylan Baker. Dylan was, Baker. This was his first role, and that character was actually reprised. He he came up with all those face ticks, the noises. That was mm-hmm. all him. He made that character, and then John Hughes was like, "I I, I want a real reaction out of Steve Martin, as John mm-hmm. Hughes always does. He tries to create these moments where." It, it brings up about a uh, a genuine reaction of the, of the other actor in the scene. He's like, spit in your hand, shake his hand, and that disgusted face that Steve Martin gives him is like legitimate, which is not the only legitimate Steve Martin uh, reaction. Or, yeah, it is not the only legitimate Steve Martin reaction in the movie. There's another great moment, which... Um, uh, get into in the, in the scenes, in the uh, favorite scenes. Let me bargain with you. Which, which sounds better? Seventeen dollars and a really nice watch, or two dollars and a Casio. John Candy tried to give this man two dollars and a and Casio. He presents it like somebody <laughs> on did, the TV did, shopping he, network. He's yeah. rubbing up in it. Casio? I'm like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Like again, only John Candy could get away. I guarantee Casios are worth a little bit more after that scene, though. And the, when they drive off in the LeBaron and they the the side mirrors and everything is gone. Did you see this do the human hand signal turn when he came off the road? I'm, which bothered me because in the very first of all here we go he's going like here we go but and there's in the scene right before that they were using a turn signal correct so the turn signals are working but when he's uses the, using the turn signal when they're peeling out of the motel he puts on the left blinker and they go right yeah I mean, I, I, I don't. I, I can't make up for that. I, I don't know what. All I know is I wasn't on set doing continuity. Had they hired me, I was five at the time. Child labor laws, whatever. We'll get back into that later. For uh, for you diehard plane trains and automobiles out fans out there, know that there is a cut of this movie that is over four, four hours, hours long. four and a half hours. That one is lost and never to be found. But there is a cut that is over three hours. Um, somewhere out there collecting dust deteriorating as we speak you could also check out the script which was 145 pages when steve martin got it he's like usually scripts are supposed to be like 90 pages and he even asked john hughes like are you gonna trim this down and john hughes look at him confused like right but he meant that and you could tell when you watch the movie and we kind of get into this with lila in the interview coming up speaking of uh, lila robbins who played steve martin's wife we'll be talking to her later We'll also be talking to Andrew Hentz, who is uh, take a picture to last longer on the bus in a little bit. But you can tell when you're watching the movie that there are that there was so much more shot because sometimes you see it used in different scenes, like what would have been a fully fleshed out scene. He just took a little bit of the footage and used it. Um, there's a lot of moments where it's almost like you're getting the punchline of a joke before the, then you never got the setup. Like the setup was on the floor somewhere. Um, 
it still plays perfectly fine. It's perfectly paced. But there is a three over three hour movie out there somewhere and a hundred and forty five page script for all you diehard fans that want more of planes, trains, and automobiles. Maybe we'll get that one day, like the Snyder cut. Right. The well, Hughes maybe cut. I would like to thank the estate of Mr. John Hughes. We'll see our show and understand how good and how we've done with this. And as a secret gift to me, and you will sign <laughs> it. Right. And we'll just get we'll just get a copy of it. One of the things I want to bring up, of course, most, when I bring up this reference, most people when I bring up the name uh, Edie McClure, when I say that, most people are going to say, "Okay, that's the reference." They know what scene that comes from. But follow me, guys, real quick. Of course, she was in another one of our '80s movies growing up, Ferris Bueller, Fer- Ferris Bueller's Days Off. But oh, that's not Rooney, right? Oh, and. <laughs> That's not the only connection between both films, though. Notice, what shot do they go to? They think he's a righteous dude. (laughs) What shot do they go to when Steve Martin's character's Ned comes in the airport after he falls down the ice hill? What What do you see? The sloppy shoes, the oh, messed up pants, yeah. the same thing that happens yeah. to Ed Rooney. But here's the crazy part: I'm going to up Good even more. Catch. He is getting off a bus when that happens in planes, trains, and automobiles. What you, uh, Rooney is getting on the bus mm-hmm. in Ferris Bueller when that happens. Eden McClurk, we love you. You just bring all my life together. Which to this day, fun fact about Edie, people still come up to her and ask and ask her to tell them you're fucked. Mm-hmm. Which I couldn't imagine. She's got to be like, a, at this point, a sweet, oldish lady. Like, have some manners, people. No, if Dr. Ruth can talk about f***ing, so can she. No, okay, yeah. Um, in the first, uh, this is the first time, I guess I was, a, I, was, I was younger the other times I've seen this movie and it, I didn't pick up on. Well, you would have to be younger because unless sure. you're, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, everything that's happening now hey, is happening now. We did Tenet on episode two. There you're, is, right, you're right, you're right. Time has blown. <laughs> but I didn't pick up on this little detail in the, mo- the first motel room they stay at. There are two perfectly placed handprints on the wall above the bed, just like, Again, those little details that John Hughes throws in his movies that fully immerse you in whatever situation you're in. This is a seedy hotel room. Seedy shit goes on there like in it. real life, too. Stay, stay tuned for big facts. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, the handprints on there, I thought that was a very nice touch in the first hotel room they stay in. All right, so I have to uh, I have to reference this. Two things I want to reference really quick. The first thing, obviously, if you noticed it, was the uh, Cool Runnings reference. Mm-hmm. John Candy's character does a Jamaican accent years prior to doing the film Cool Runnings. And it was just so amazing to see that. And then, uh, furthermore, if I'm not mistaken, he drops the line. Uh, the same line he says about the car, he says about the sled. It's not pretty, it'll but it'll get, get you where you, you want to go. go. So, boom. Check mark, blue check mark for that. Love it. Mm-hmm. But one of the things me and you are more than likely going to disagree on is the film Due Date. Clearly, I, I hate remakes and I hate sequels. When I tell you Due Date did this film such justice for so many reasons, but one of the main reasons which you thought you did not exist, which you tried to talk to me about last night, was that it had no now don't get me wrong it's not it's not the emotional pull at the end that i will not say that it's not trains planes and automobile however mm-hmm. the trunk which john candy carried around which carried his uh picture pillow. of his wife and his pillow mm-hmm. the the trunk and due date was the urn that zach galifianakis ca- carried with his father's uh ashes in it so to me they're both traveling across the country with memory uh, nope don't you do it nope nope don't you do it contrived contrived Deri- by who? derivative of what they're just they they saw like oh plane trains and automobiles automobiles did this let's just take that formula and slap some new details oh no it didn't feel as there wasn't as much weight to it no it wasn't as much weight but i'll be completely honest with you it like if you want if you want to ask me which one's funnier i don't think you want to ask me that i i don't think there's a winner i'm serious like due date does it for me man i'm sorry what are you doing? Go to beat my boys at Chili's. He got his ass whooped by uh, Danny, uh, not Danny Masterson. Sorry, he's in jail somewhere, but you know what I'm talking about, guy. Uh, 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 yeah. Listen, okay, so clearly I'm, we're going to disagree on I'm, this. We're yeah, not going to have a kill mugger exactly. situation. I'm just letting you know this for is, all my fans out there, due date fans, holler at me. And if not, hate is, on him. This is Thanksgiving. Let's just be thankful that we have two movies to enjoy. One that's excellent and another one. All right. <laughs> Um, uh, one thing I, th- so I, I wonder if Neil is always as edgy as he is in this movie. Like we're seeing him in a moment in time where everything is going wrong for him. So he, he comes off as like the prick. He comes off as like having no tolerance, no patience. And, and I always thought that this is just who he is. This is who he is as a person. But 
For the first time last night when I watched it for the deep dive, it dawned on me that maybe we're just seeing him react appropriately to all the bullshit that's happening to him and the glimpse that you get of who he might really be aside from those characteristics is when the flashback scene or the well when he's on the uh when he's on the train the first time and speaking of uh planes planes. see yes (laughs) guys do not how much do you not know how much it costs for a flyover kids save up (laughs) When he's on the train for the first time, uh, thinking that, like, all right, I'm home free, I'm finally going home. Not at the end, but that, that right. where he's sitting next Before to, it breaks uh, down, yes. Where he's sitting next to the girl, um, suddenly he's the chatty Cathy. Like, you going home? I'm, I should make it just in time for dinner. Like, he is almost like John Candy's character in right. that moment because things are finally, he thinks, going to work out for him. So that was just interesting to me. I was wondering if maybe... But to more to that point, it showed his humanity later on, maybe two or three minutes later, because when he clearly had a chance to get get Dale out of his life, he sees him carrying the, the, the suitcase and barely making it across the field, and he goes to help him. So if mm-hmm. he was a prick and always edgy, he wouldn't have done that. So that definitely speaks to your point. Um, one thing before we move off of this, I know we're coming oh, winding no, down. No, I got another yes, page. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Bueller, Bueller. Bueller, mm-hmm. I, no, that's our that second connection to the uh, to the films from Ferris Bueller as well as Planes, Trains, Automobile. But it was what he said when he said all flights have been canceled, and he gets this big fucking smile on his yeah. face, like you're smiling at my fucking misery. And if you look on the screen behind him at that time, the, nowhere, the, nowhere. They yep. say they're fucking going nowhere, guys. You can't keep up with us, um, Man, mustard. <laughs> okay. The, the and speaking of John Hughes references, there's another John Hughes reference uh, in this movie. How it ends? It ends with the freeze frame of John mm. Candy smiling. Not Uncle Buck. What movie was it? We did the freeze frame. Um, Uncle Buck. <laughs> oh, Mr. Roy, you're on. F-ing, you're on fire today. Yeah, they, they both end with that sweet smile of John Candy just freeze framing in the thing. I love that man. Let me make sure we didn't miss it. Like guys, oh, there's a. We, they, I got. I got one more page here. Go, no, I, I could rapid gun through them if we need to. So the uh, Del, Del's wife. Uh, spoiler alert. Um, Del's wife is dead. dead. He's alone. He just wants a friend. Mm -hmm. So when you realize that, when when you go back and watch the movie knowing that, it is, there is is so much more emotion to it. Like It's another movie. When they get on the train, he's trying so hard to get Neil's address. Right. Because... If he this isn't like 2020, you can't find him on Facebook after this. You can't like there's the only like once they part ways, the only way that they're gonna meet again is by happenstance. Maybe uh-huh. say, you no, it's not because he stole his he stole his he stole his uh, Madonna's club card. He was gonna mail it back to him. Didn't, have, didn't have any address. address. <laughs> so that 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 moment hit me, and when he's like, I haven't been home in years. The uh, you know, and he says just a figure of speech you know, in the diner. On the road. Mm-hmm. Um. And then that that moment where Neil wants to, he's like, maybe maybe we should divide and conquer. Maybe we should go our separate ways. Oh, he broke his heart when he said that. That is the only time that you see Dell like offended and on the offensive. Like he's like, I'll see. No, I'll go this time. I'll see you around. Yeah, sure you will. Like you never see him kind of like angry like that, express anger in any way like that. So that was, um, and then uh, when they're sitting in the car and he's like. He's talking to his wife, and you're like, the first time you watch, it's like, yeah, you could. He's just imagining he's talking to his wife, but then you know that she's not there. He's really talking to her spirit. Right. Like, I wish you were here, but you know, with me right now. But I guess that 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 isn't gonna happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, and then when they're when they're drinking, and and Steve Martin Neil says to Dell, he's like, at the very least, you have a woman you love to grow old with, and Dell just like that look that Dell gives him, like. He wants to tell him in that moment, but he doesn't want to ruin the good vibe. Last thing, real quick, uh, the uh, be appropriate end on John Candy. Remember, at the end, he's <clears throat> he's 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 trying to help someone get home. He's in the back of a van, just like in Home Alone reference, trying to give her help her to get home and Kevin mm-hmm. in the back of a van. Okay, let's talk about the fact that Dell sabotages Neil completely. Oh, like they like uh, Zach Galifianakis did Robert De Niro, uh, Robert Downey Jr. Do that. All right, you get you get one more due date in this episode that has nothing to do with due date. Okay, subpar. I, I'm a fan of Robert Downey Jr. Are you? and I, Zach I'll let him know when I see him which is why I was so let down. They could have done so much better. Did you see Doctor Doolittle? 
That's when I was let down. Yeah. Let's, no, let's, let's, no let's, I didn't. Neither did most. <laughs> um, so, the, the and the reason why I bring up Del Sabotage and Neil's because I have an interesting theory about how this movie is not a happy ending. Because you have... All right, so first he trips over the chest mm-hmm. that, he, that, that costs him the first cab. Then he steals the next cab. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I, I and, and I know we talked about this earlier, we both are in the firm belief that he stole that rental car. Oh, he you, definitely you stole it. V5. Get, you v- don't, I think it's J5. V- no, it's V5. Okay, I'll, 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 it's V5. I'll, no, I'll trust your memory on that. Thank you. Um, I, I, you see the skid marks pulling out of there. You cannot get, uh, like, like Neil says, you can't get a rental car with, uh, with uh, shower curtain rings. You also, I don't think, can get a rental car with a diner's club card. Yeah. Um, so I, I firmly believe that he stole that car, screwed him out of the rental car. Uh, and it's kind of shown visually when they get caught between the two semis when Dell is driving them the wrong way on the highway, literally taking him in the wrong direction. Uh, he turns into the devil. Neil sees him as the devil. <laughs> he did say that. Um, he did do that. And then uh, when the car blows up, he's, Neil's like, ha, you finally did it to yourself. And he didn't. He it, did it to still. you. So the reason why I think this is a, it's not a happy ending, it, even though, you know, it is on the surface, it's feel good, it's emotional. But if you really think about the implication of what's happening here. Dell, the rest of Neil's life is going to be like this now. Right. Like he, I know it's, I know it's heartless to say, but he should have left him at that train station because his family is going to now pay the price for this decision he made to bring Dell home. Right. It, there's just a Put lot this to way, be implied. If there. you're talking about the lost footage of this film and you're talking about how it, it's not a happy ending, what I thought was maybe at a certain, you know, people snap at a certain point in life. So maybe when he left, he was like, you know what, he was leaving like, you know what. This motherfucker caused me a lot of anguish this weekend. I'm going to kill him. I'm literally going to kill him. Come with me. No, what are you doing? No, no, no. Come with me. He brought him home. And like his wife was probably crying because he's happy. He said, we don't know what happened. Maybe I'll, I'll just stay for a little bit and then I'll head out. Just come in, Dale. Dale. Yeah. Poison. Um, so just some uh, some fun facts that I came across that. These aren't really, top ten facts. These are fun facts. Yeah, just didn't really fit into the, the big fights. Um. Of their own films, this was both Steve Martin's and John Candy's favorite movie that they starred in, mm-hmm. um, which is cool. So if this is your favorite movie, you have something in common with John Candy and Steve Martin. Yes. Except you didn't star in it. Uh, mm-hmm. The exterior shot of the plane in flight. Is From airplane. Mm-hmm. I saw that. I saw that real time. I'm lying. I had to look that up. But shit, it felt good to see it with confidence. That, this is something that I think is amazing. This movie only took John Hughes three days to write. Now, 20 rewrites. But sure. three, no, but I'm just, we're going by what he said. Yeah, 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 definitely. But and but even in general, like most of his movies take took him three to five days to write. So like all you people out there is like I'm still working on the script. It's almost ready. I'm gonna just gonna get it done in a little bit. I just gotta I gotta get it right. F- that take your hundred and f- he wrote hundred and forty two pages in three days, seventy two hours. One and I unfair this now. We must state that it was this film was based off his own experience now. So it's a little bit easier to write when it's something that's pissed you the fuck off. However, guys, he's right. Sure. I don't want to see your your rewrites and your re- Just put the shit on film. If it's shit, make it better shit until it's good shit, until it's not shit, until it's the shit. Fix it in and post. I, yep. There you go. Uh, put that on the show. Ah, shit. <laughs> um, now, what the f- You're on that shit again, aren't you? Yeah. I'm on, uh, let me grab a fork. <laughs> you had one. So, guys, this is where I take a time out to tell you we're having an intervention for David. He's, he's using Surge again. Makes your brain big and your dick small. Don't let him do it to you guys. Oh, sorry. What, what did I miss? What did you say? Nothing. All right. You have a huge one. <laughs> um, so, all right. We, we talked about the John Hughes stage and improv moments. That was good. Um, did you notice anything about the rental car? Which one? The one that was... And, and I'll give you a hint. We're talking about the... Thro- like doing callbacks to other John Hughes movies. This th- That car was used in another one of he, the films he did one year prior to that, if I'm not mistaken. Not used, but it was it was done in the same uh, spirit of to kind of resemble the Griswold station wagon. Yes, yes, freaking... Uh, Clark. Uh, yeah. Man, see, see what I'm talking about, guys? He's giving us so much. 
And the last thing I have is on Dell's trunk. His name reads Del. Oh, uh, oh. D-O-G. Dog. Spaceballs right. reference. Okay. You want that? Because I got that. You okay. want that? Because I got that. Barf. Or you want that? Because that's the acronym, too. Ludicrous speed. Oh. Uh. All oh. right. Find us in all these links. It's coming up right now. When you subscribe, it'll last longer.